Good morning, Bethel Ridge. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. According to the weatherman, the sun is going to pop out real soon through this fog. And I would say it's a great day for a picnic. <laughs> well, let's have a picnic, only we'll have an indoor one. Um, we do have potluck today, right after the service, so everyone that can stay, um, please do that and um, just enjoy each other's fellowship, enjoy the food. Um, just one of the wonderful things about being a church family is uh, we share together in uh, both uh, fun and food and in fellowship. Um, other announcements um, are up on the board and um, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. I hope you're enjoying the Wednesday devotionals that come out each week. Uh, make sure you take uh, advantage of that and read those. This morning our psalm is from Psalm 85, the first seven verses. Lord, you were favorable to our land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, to our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry for, with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Dear Father, we come this morning knowing that you are a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who doesn't give us what we deserve, but a God who gives us his love and his mercy in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in that. We want to glorify you today, honor you with everything that we are doing here at Bethel Ridge today. So Father, help us to focus on you, to praise you, and to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we are able to ask this. Amen. Please stand, if you would, as, if, as you, our ability allows you for our opening songs.
We believe every month we we feature just one of the items from the statement of faith from our from our, our Constitution uh, this morning we believe in the Holy Trinity now the idea of Trinity is an absolute scandal uh, among every group that says they're monotheistic they believe in one god uh, groups that claim to be christian and are not and groups that aren't christian at all uh, islam or even judaism and, and but they all it, it, it's it's a scandal the word trinity does not it's not found in the bible it's a word the church uses to describe what the bible is teaching about god it's humanly incomprehensible. There is one God. But that God, in some way we can understand, has three persons. Three roles, all of them perfectly equal. So that when the Bible talks about the will of God, it's talking about the will of God the Father. When the Bible talks about what God does on earth in creation, in redemption, in ruling, and all of those things, speaking by the word, it's talking about the Son, Jesus. When the Bible talks about all those wonderful things that, that, that the God works in us, our, the, a, a new birth, and, and, and life and, and and the gifts and the fruit the spirit and um, well you get the idea all the things that that God works in us he does through the Holy Spirit one God three persons three roles we worship and pray to the Father we do it in the name of his son inspired by the Holy Spirit so that's the Trinity and 
you know, you find it, the more you read, you get the idea of the Trinity in your head, and the more you read, particularly the New Testament, you see it everywhere. There was, when Jesus was baptized, the Father spoke from heaven, and of course Jesus was on earth, and he sent the Spirit. Um, in, when Jesus talked about baptism, he says, you will baptize people in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And then a wonderful thing a promise Jesus made. He said to his disciples, the things that I have spoken to you while I am still with you, these are the things I've told you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Trinity, it is a very powerful idea. Thank you, Dan. We're going to uh, prayer time now, and I just want you to think a little bit about the one member of the Trinity when we pray, our Father. What a privilege that is to say, our Father. Think about what that denotes to you, the relationship that you have. Jesus told us to pray that way, our Father. We can do that, of course, because of the work of the cross and of the Holy Spirit within us. And we can commune with God and call him our Father and bring him our request. What a privilege, how intimate that is. And we begin our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer as our Savior, Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we are so privileged to be able to address you as our Father. We thank you, we praise you, we come this morning to worship you. And there are so many things, Father, that are so difficult in this world today. War, it's been around ever since the beginning, ever since, well, ever since Adam and Eve's children. And Father, today, I want to pray for the situation in the Ukraine, in Russia. And Father, we ask for wisdom. Wisdom from both sides. Pray that there be a desire for peace, that there'll be peace. And we pray for protection for the Christians in Ukraine and all the people in the Ukraine. We pray for our nation and our role in these world events and for wisdom for our, our president and our Congress. And I pray that we might have a desire, that they might have a desire to return to biblical truths. I want to pray, Father, for our mission projects that we have in the past. And we pray for the village of Arai, that they continue to have clean water, that the word of God may be spoken there, and that a church may be established in that community. We pray for the Buddha Masa project that we were privileged to have a part in. For the education of the students, that that education might include the Word of God, that they might turn to Jesus and be saved. We pray for our Compassion International young people, 
Francis in the Philippines, Miriam in Tanzania, as these young people coming into adulthood, um, Father, I pray that you'll bless them and keep them safe from exploitation, from harm, and provide their needs. And may they have opportunity to both hear and read your word. Pray with those in our members of Bethel Ridge and those that consider Bethel Ridge their home for health issues. Thinking of Marty and Kurt and pray that you'll bless them give them peace give them encouragement give them strength lord we pray for jim and jeanette cup who are moving tomorrow into their new facility and uh, lord we pray that this will be a good move for them and we pray that you'll bless them and um, all the anxiety that can come from such a move pray lord you'll give them their, your peace and father for the rest of us here at Bethel Ridge, we all have unspoken needs, every one of us. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you know them, your spirit living within us knows them. Pray that you'll bless and grant um, those things which will help us become more like our Savior, Jesus. And now, Father, as Dan brings a message this morning, open our hearts, open our minds to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I just finished something that I did just for my, purely for my own enjoyment. I wrote the story of my childhood. And I'm going to tell you a, just a little bit of one of the, just one of the things that happened. And it, it was about when I was just the age of just some of you guys. The city of Los Angeles, where I lived, um, they had a picnic and they invited all of the people who worked for the city of Los Angeles to come to the picnic and invited their families. Well, my dad painted buildings for the city of Los Angeles. So our family at that time, um, we all went to this wonderful picnic. And they had wonderful food and they had games, they had all kinds of stuff going on. Um, but one of the things they were doing is they had foot races. Well, my dad, my, my, he called me Buzz. You know, my dad never called us by our given names, but that was my nickname, just Buzz. Anyway, he said, Buzz, um, you know, get in line. They, the guys for my, in my age group were all lining up. And he says, you know, get in line for the race. And, nope, I'm not gonna do it. Come on, come on, you can do it. Nope, nope, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. I mean, I looked at it, there was a long line. These guys were all bigger than me, because I was the shrimp. At that age, I grew, I mean, I was a shrimp. These guys were all bigger than me. And there was a bunch of them, and every one of them was a complete stranger. And I had never run a race before. No, no way I was going to do it. <laughs> no, nope, not going to do it. Just before the race actually started, my dad finally kind of got through to me and I changed my mind. And I lined up on the very end, just kind of like this, you know. The gun went off, bang, and I took off. Well, everybody raced like mad to the finish line. In fact, we went through the finish line because some of us didn't know when, you know when to quit and kept on going. Anyway, when they finally stopped us, some guy, man comes up to me and, and he, uh, he kind of laughed about the fact that I had just run all the way practically to the end of the block. Um, and, and he said, well, come on. And so he brought me up to another guy who had a, a brown package about like this. In that brown package, he peeled out the first silver dollar I had ever seen. It was big, it was bright, and he handed it to me. I had won the race. I didn't know I'd won it until that point. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of things that 
I wished I had listened to my dad and changed my mind about. <laughs> There's a whole lot more about things that I have wished in my life that I had listened to God and changed my mind. There's a wonderful word in the Bible called repent. And that, that's this, this day, is, this Sunday is going to be all about. That word simply means change your mind. Listen to what God says, and even if you don't like what he's saying, change your mind. <coughs> You'll discover that it's the best thing you could have ever done. Well, let's sing a song. A wonderful song. You, Everybody, we all want to change our mind and... and, and and, and so we can all sing this wonderful song. God so loved the world. <laughs> fun thing this morning we're gonna do a little word association thing I'm gonna say the word and I want you to say what one word not a phrase not a sentence not a paragraph one word that you associate with this so the word perish what word do you immediately associate that with <laughs> You know, it's the saddest word in the Bible. Because it's the one word that means hopeless. Final. It's over. Okay, how about the word repent? Change. Turn. Turn. I mean, there's a lot of words we could use for that word. We're going to look at that word this morning in two lights. Both of them are very important. The first light is God's commands. We look at it in the light, in light of God's commands. And the second in the light of God's promises. We'll see if we have any changing of our minds we want to do. You know, repent or perish. That is about as, you know, I don't know they always use this word, but the prophets of today, they are all using that. that, that. Isn't that right? When people talk about the pandemic, it's repent or perish. They talk about the climate change. If we don't repent, we will perish. And I, all the prophets of today are using this. Well, I'm not interested in that. I am interested in what Jesus said about it. Luke, the 13th chapter. I'm going to read uh, two different places. I, um, if we start out with the first five verses. There were some present at that very time, they were, they were with Jesus, who told him about the Galileans. They came from northern Israel, where Jesus came from, whose blood Pilate, the Roman governor, had mingled 
with their temple sacrifices. Which, by the way, would not have been an unusual thing because Pilate, Josephus, the Jewish historian, talks about some of the things Pilate did. That's the kind of thing he did. And Jesus answered them. They, 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 brought, they, they came to Jesus with this story, and they, it, was current, it was a current event. It just happened. And they wanted to know what Jesus thought about it. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he goes on to tell another one. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What was Jesus' point? It wasn't what they expected. Were these people who had these tragedies happen, were they uh, worse people than, than you are? What Jesus is saying is that this world will perish one day in God's judgment on disobedience. It's going to happen. And the things that terrorize us, or the tragedies of our lives, Ukraine, the pandemic, climate change, whatever, they are red flags warning us that unless we, you and I, not just Vladimir Putin, unless you and I repent, we're going to perish with the world. It's going to happen. And then he goes on to tell his own story. It comes right, it's, it, it's a story that is just full of Old Testament uh, imagery. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, which was a very common thing to do. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree. I find none. Cut it down. Why should I use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and, and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Jesus was really telling a story about his own nation, the vineyard that God had planted, and the, the tree that often, they were planted in the, often in the middle of a vineyard. Because it's, the nation was, was created to bear fruit and, and this tree was created and planted to bear fruit there was a three-year time it, the plant was planted the tree and then it had three years to prepare you know it wasn't going to bear fruit the fourth year when they expected to start seeing fruit that was holy to the lord you didn't touch it and then after that you were expecting you you're going to benefit from this thing you were going to pick the fruit well of course in this case three years after all this it hadn't happened. And the law of nature is cut it down. I mean, it's, it's hopeless. It's, it's drawing nourishment, but it's not producing, it's not giving us anything. Cut it down, get rid of it, burn it up. And then you see the heart of God. I mean, does God really want to visit this world and aid us so that we all perish? He said to, through Peter, that, that God is not slow in keeping his promise. He's talking about the end and the judgment and all of that. He said, but he is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but to 
come to the knowledge of the truth. And what Jesus was said in this parable, he was talking about himself, that he was giving his entire life for these people, knowing full well that in 40 years, Rome was going to destroy their nation. And it happened. Okay. Well, that's about repentance. What is repentance? It's a Hebrew word, and it goes into the Greek word. And the root idea goes in kind of different directions, but all the same idea. But the root idea is to change your mind. That's what repent means. It doesn't immediately say anything about behavior. Change your mind. If we look at this through God's commandments, we call it his law, but I, I like the word commandments. We look at it in the light of God's commandments. Well, when I look in the mirror, as James says, I look in the mirror, God's commandments. What do I see? I see myself as God sees me in the light of his commandments, his righteousness. As he said to one man who had come to him and asked about salvation, they talked about the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, do this and you will live. All about behavior. Well, we got a problem. It's not enough to say that I'll do my best. I'm sincere. I try. Jesus said, you must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That doesn't leave any wiggle room. And then he talks about the, all the commandments of God, and he reduces it to this. You will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. And you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's scary. Commands that we can't do. Because we have a poisoned human nature. As Paul said, no person will ever be declared right by God by the things that they do. God gave us his commands to show us our sin. It's a pretty hopeless situation. You know, Paul thought that he could do it. Uh, you know, I drive down this, this Central Avenue in Faribault, and you know the buildings, they, a lot of beautiful buildings. You drive in the alleys way behind the buildings, what do they look like? We can never satisfy God's righteousness, his commands, with our behavior. We just can't do it. Because we have this sin poison nature. And we can't rectify the problem of our guilt by being sorry for it. Paul talks about this in himself. He says, man, what a miserable man that I am. You see, the problem is, is that when God says to repent, it's just another command we can't keep. Looks like parish is all we've got left. Now we have to look at repentance in the light of God's law, his commands. We have to. We also must look at it in the light of God's promises in the gospel. 
Now it's true. You know, I, I have to acknowledge the truth of what God's commands reveal, how God sees me. His commands, they, they're, they're never removed. Righteousness still matters, guilt matters. I still deserve to perish. When I look at it through his law, that's what it looks like. And then I look at it in the light of his promises in the gospel. Now get this. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever cleans up his act and is really sorry whoever believes in the son will not perish he has eternal life how does that work <clears throat> In his death, he took our guilt, he took your guilt, all of it, upon himself. And in doing so, he laid the basis for God's forgiveness. As his servant John said, who heard all of this, he said, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin if we confess our sin didn't didn't say to, to you know to change your life it didn't do anything like that if you confess your sin he is faithful he's just to forgive us our sin cleanse us from all unrighteousness and the second thing he did paul says that this this kind of blows your mind to the person who who puts their faith in jesus Paul says that that person is credited with Jesus' righteousness. He's clothed in it. It's all he needs. So that. Repentance. Is not a self-righteous attempt to earn our be to earn God's favor by our behavior. It's simply by faith in Jesus Christ. You see what repentance is? Putting our faith in Jesus Christ, embracing it, take refuge in Him. In his blood and his righteousness. That's it. Is that a different way of thinking about repentance? That's what it is. Now you're probably asking, well, wait a minute. You know, Paul talked a whole lot of things about behavior. And he was talking to Christians like us when he did it. When we look at repentance in the light of God's promises in the gospel, his commands look very different. They aren't condemning us anymore. Jesus took all that. They begin to look like his promises. They really do. You know, Paul would say, don't lie anymore. That has, that, that stinks. That's hell. That's perishing. You don't want to do that. The truth, that's life. He says, you know, don't steal anymore. But you, you, you know, give your, your work hard so you could give your money away. Generosity. That smells like heaven. That's our destiny. 
That's life. That's what's good. Our sin is forgiven. We are clothed in righteousness. We are no longer trying to earn these things by the things that we do. As we do with Paul said, you know, put off one and, you know, put off gossip and put on encouragement. Put off lust and put on those things. These things that Jesus paid his, with his life to deliver us from. He's talking to people who are citizens of his kingdom. He said, you're a citizen. He said, you're a priest in my temple. He says, you're my beloved child. He said, you're my saint. You're my chosen one. You're the one that I gave my life, you know, to, uh, for you. You're the one that I've invested with my spirit. I have given you the power to love. You're not here to earn his salvation. As we look at the commands of God, we're simply learning to live in his salvation. It's wonder, it's glory. Repentance is simply opening my heart to what is really living in place of the stuff that causes people to perish. Well, we're going to fail. All of us do. We still have that sin poison nature. What do we do? We take our stand in Jesus' blood and his righteousness, and we go on. Now, my favorite word association with repent is hope it's full of hope we got to sing about that let's stand and sing my hope is built on nothing less <laughs> say amen to that father it's your servant Peter who said that repentance it's not our great achievement that repentance itself is a gift of God's spirit that opens our life to you oh father thank you benediction from Peter Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord.
And our doxology is the final verse of that wonderful hymn. Come with trumpet sound, oh may I then 